Hello, welcome to Graphic Policy Radio. This is your host, Elana Levin. And this is a show for people who know that a Captain America story is inherently extremely political and who've witnessed enough of it that we know that the results might vary. Uh, This is also for viewers who want to know if the power broker's long-term plan is building a cross-bonk expressway through Madripoor. (laughs) So that's right, kids. We're talking about Falcon and the Winter Soldier tonight. And um, this is going to be entirely full of spoilers because that is the nature of how people have been mainlining their Disney Plus Marvel content. We're going to assume you've seen it. I guess I should just do the quick version for anyone who hasn't watched it yet. The quick version that I often tell folks is like, should you watch this or not? And I'm actually going to say no. Um, so if you haven't watched this yet, spare yourself. But, um, although I suppose there's, there's worse things you could do with your time, but there's many, many better ones. Um, uh, my guests may have a different, um, ultimate conclusion on that matter. But from, from here on out, we will assume that you, if you've listening to us, you've watched the show, you have made the investment in your time to spend it with, uh, Disney plus MCU show and, um, you know, for folks who were here before, like we had a really rich conversation around WandaVision. So I, I came into this with high hopes, but uh-huh. joining me, uh, joining me are some returning guests. And, um, I am joined by returning guest Spencer Ackerman. He is a journalist and author of Reign of Terror, how the 9-11 era destabilized America and produced Trump, which is going to be out August 10th from Viking. Welcome back to the show, Spencer. Thank you so much for having me, Alana. I am so excited to have this conversation. Yeah, yeah. You guys were like the first people who I bothered as soon as I finished watching the show. So the the other person who's joining me is Brandon Wilson. He is a filmmaker and lecturer, born and raised in Los Angeles. He attended UCLA, where he took a BA in African American Studies and an MFA from the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. Brandon has directed two micro-budget features, 2005's The Man Who Couldn't, which is on YouTube, and Sepulveda from 2016, which is streaming for free on Vimeo, and you guys should really watch them, especially if you've gone to the trouble of watching this. Um, (laughs) Wilson has taught film analysis for filmmakers and introduction to editing courses at UCLA. He also teaches at Columbia College, Hollywood, um, Los Angeles Valley College, NYU's Los Angeles branch and Long Beach City College, where he teaches classics on auteur filmmakers, national cinema, the essay film, and diversity in cinema. Welcome back, Brandon. Thank you so much for having me. Very, very excited to uh, to be here. And uh, and to be clear, be guys, like when I when I when I when I messaged Brandon right after I finished watching the show, and we realized that we needed to just jump on a Zoom together to talk about it. We both were completely coincidentally wearing Marvel merch. Okay, like we came <laughs> into this wanting wanting to feel love like wanting this to be great and there certainly Mm -hmm. are things about it that i think are um but uh this is also a show that i think a lot of us share a lot of criticisms of and uh we we're gonna just dig dig right dig right into them um so yeah i had 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 expectations and as per usual you know great performances i think it was great performances all around and as per usual you know I think people were pretty happy with casting. I have like a little bit mixed bag. And frankly, I think on John Walker, but that's just because I have a massive problem with John Walker and the entire show. I, um, I was really looking forward to seeing Marvel show us what a right wing Captain America would look like. And Marvel seems to not, uh, because that's the whole purpose of this character, you know, in the comics. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's really important for Marvel to have a right wing version of Cap because it shows us that the real Cap, our Captain America, and our current Captain America, the new one, um, are left wing. And if you don't have a right wing Captain America, then it doesn't really. You need that contrast there. Um, and uh, I thought the whole thing with John Walker was pretty awful. Mm-hmm. So. Starting with that point, um, I mean, I know people will, m- are familiar with the U.S. agent character um, in concept, at least from the uh, the Captain America comics. He, you know, he steps in for Real Cap when Real Cap is disillusioned with the government and goes to be a free agent, and he's sort of the jingoistic right wing, you know, Captain America. And I'm like, I'm waiting, keep waiting for this to fully happen, and uh, mm-hmm. instead we get this like. Re- attempted a white man redemption story that i had no interest in seeing 
Yeah, I guess I'm gonna jump in. I I can't I can't uh, I can't hold my hold back any any longer. Yeah, that to me, I'll I'll say that I have often declared, which it seems like I'm sort of throwing down the gauntlet when I say this on Twitter. Um, you know where I'm on as genius bastard that, that Marvel's never made the in Marvel Studios in terms of the MCU has never made a bad film. That even when we look at the worst, the weakest of their films you know, Iron Man 2 or Thor The Dark World, that when you compare them to some other things, you realize that, okay, these may not be great, but they're still at least passable. They're decent. They're not, they're just, it's not bad. Here, I think this is the first thing, this is the first thing from Marvel Studios that I think we can say objectively is bad. At least, at least that I can say that I really did not enjoy, that I think just failed up and down. And I think John Walker is a great place to start because the show's, complete sort of um punting on john walker the complete sort of uh, the, the unwillingness of the show to commit to john walker um i don't know if it's stupidity a political naivete or political stupidity or political cowardice i don't know which one of those it is but i think in this moment that we're all experiencing and you know i should say that the, the show was originally slated to premiere in August of 2020, but because of COVID, um, they pulled the plug on it and it was sort of in limbo and they couldn't sort of go forward. And just by the sort of vagaries of, of, of fate, WandaVision ended up being the sort of flagship series um, that launched the MCU on Disney+. Plus. It was not meant to be that way. It was really, this was the show that was supposed to to launch, just to, to start this whole new enterprise. Um, but, it, and we can talk about that, but um, it just fails so deep, profoundly the moment, you know, to have this character that you just won't take a stand on, you know, to reduce, to, to completely remove ideology from him as altogether, to try to dodge the idea that there's a, you know, right wing and a left wing and that, you know, old cap was, was had these left wing tendencies and, decided to become the conscience. And so it would seem that this new cap would have to be the, the opposite number, but the show was just so invested in from the, from the gate, just, you know, humanizing him, making us understanding him. Um, you know, all these things are fine, but it just robs the show of, you know, ideologies clashing can be really rich in comic book movies and, uh, make them very enjoyable. Even if it's not political ideologies, just as long as the character has a sharp, defined point of view um and this doesn't have that so john walker just is this guy and then to lean on ptsd is frankly offensive at this point to just sort of use that as the, you're out like that's what's wrong with him is his ptsd especially if you're not willing to talk about why he's got ptsd and what it is that he did that you know because then of course you get you're getting political again so this show just attempted i think to sort of dodge any sort of being too political when that's really kind of impossible in this moment and um def and just in general and so right it's it's clearly they wanted us to sort of become invested in the redemption of john walker and obviously they've got plans from the future but yeah it was a pretty staggering failure um to me to, to see what they did with this yeah um i think what you said brandon really gets to the heart of what made this show unfortunate, uh, which is its refusal uh, to take active, clear stands, state their implications, and artfully make characters avatars for particular points of view. And at every stage, particularly with, jo with, with John Walker, uh, they decide they want to gesture at having these critiques and then back away from it immediately as soon as the implications start perhaps getting you know too real and my general sense for this entire show was just wondering why they decided to mine the material from the comics that are touchstones for this show given what they weren't willing to do with them and I think there's a tremendous amount, you know, to mine from all of um, the evasions 
that the show decides to make. And, you know, I, you know, like you said earlier, Alana, I was very excited and hopeful to see a right wing Captain America to have, you know, first off, right wingers get to have their MCU fun, too. Um, (laughs) You know, let's 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 not pretend like this, you know, that this community you know, shares the values of, of the three of us, right? Um, they deserve representation as well. Um, and yet they didn't really, I think, you know, do a, a service to, you know, their actual right-wing fans um, by giving us this John Walker who's just sort of neither nor, like, standing not really for much except for his righteousness. And there's significance to mine out of that. Um, You know, the genius of Alan Moore among so much is his recognition in the comedian that the real Captain America looks to the world like the Joker, right? Like that's what Mm -hmm. American hegemony is. That's what American foreign policy compels. That's what the interests that guide American foreign policy, which is to say capital demand, right? So you're never, of course, going to get that with the Mouse Corporation, but you do (laughs) want to see if they're going to have, you know, John Walker at all, you know, make at the very least, you know, one, you know, definitive political or cultural stand by, you know, virtue of like, that's kind of what's baked into using this character. Mm -hmm. And if you're not going to do that as they didn't, why, why do this at all? Why, why were we ultimately here? Why did we suffer through like watching (laughs) them like, you know, create Battlestar only to kill him in a hero's journey for a white guy who like ends up delivering the, you think Lamar's life didn't matter. (laughs) Like, yeah, I screamed. <laughs> like, do not what? have your right wing Captain America say Black Lives Matter to a black woman antihero. Like, no, no. And I know they were so proud of themselves in the right. Like, they thought, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? And well, not really. But yeah, that that was quite a moment. I I, I think my, well, my my mouth fell open at that. But I'm sorry. Continue, please. No, I was gonna say, Brandon. Brandon told me something. Um, about the creation of the show that just made my jaw drop when he told it to me. And as soon as he explained to me this, so many things about the political choices of the show made sense. Would you like to share that fact, Brandon? I'm eager to hear. Yes. Um, the show, for those who don't know, um, the head writer and showrunner is Malcolm Spellman. Um, now, I don't know Malcolm Spellman. I, I seem to know a lot of people who know him through social media. A lot of he's, There's a lot of goodwill towards him, I think, uh, in general. Um, especially on sort of black screenwriter Twitter. But um, the two things that he's really known for, number one is his time on the show Empire, um, where he was a showrunner, a show writer, not a runner. He was not a showrunner, but he was a writer on that show. And then, of course, he was very briefly involved in the ill-fated Confederate um, uh, pilot that, uh, the, the, that Benioff and Weiss were going to do uh, for HBO, and if I'm not mistaken, his wife, who was also a writer, was going to be involved. I believe they are not on Twitter to this day because of that. So we don't have to worry about any tweets um, from from <laughs> Mr. Spellman, but because uh, he left when when the, during that firestorm. Um, so yeah, this is not that is an interesting thing to sort of put into the to look at sort of the political misfires and miscalculations with this show. And right, that this was all that, that on some other timeline that he wasn't he was working on Confederate and not working on Falcon and Winter Soldier. But yeah, that, that that's that's true. Now, the story goes and I've tried to read a few things about the sort of the genesis of the show that, you know, he was basically brought in along with others to pitch his ideas. And he wanted to do sort of the 80s buddy action film and, and you know, with clearly lethal weapon and. 48 hours being sort of the, the, the shows that, that he felt would be sort of interesting to model this thing on. Cause you've got, you know, this, uh, interracial buddy, uh, buddy, uh, 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 duo who do not like each other particularly has been established. 
Um, so that was his pitch. Apparently the pitch went really poorly. He was suffering from a migraine, but he, uh, and, and enough of it, it landed enough that the, that, uh, he made it through and, and people sort of considered him, uh, you know, he, he made it through the process. I know that Nate Moore worked a lot with him. Nate Moore, of course, um, the African-American member of sort of the, the MCU, uh, small council, if you will, that, that of, of executive producers that work with Kevin Feige. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, that's what I know about that. And, and, you know, Spellman um, doesn't have a huge, uh, list of credits. Um, but yeah, th- th- those are the few, um, and he assembles his team, all male writers, by the way, I just, I just noticed, um, hmm. you know, not, not a single female writer, probably offset by the, or the, in their minds offset by the fact that, Ka- uh, Kari Skoglin, the director of every, all six episodes is a woman. Um, so probably felt that they had sort of checked that box, but I thought that was interesting. Um, the most ner- notable member of the writing staff being um, Derek uh, Kolstad, who did um, the John Walker, uh, excuse me, John Wick, <laughs> the John Wick series. So he's the writer of that. So he wrote the third and fourth episode. Um, the others seem to be sort of TV writers that I think I, I imagine Spellman has worked with or, uh, or or is familiar with. So that's that's the sort of genesis of the show. It just seems like basically they didn't really have a strong. We they obviously the whole point of the show is Sam getting the shield, um, mm-hmm. but it just seems like beyond that there was not a lot of care put into exactly how we got there, um, and and just sort of, I mean for me I don't know about you all but the, for me the they kept talking up how the the show was going to feel like a six hour Marvel movie in sort of in ep- in sort of six episodes and it didn't feel like that at all to me it just felt like a very sort of sloppy television show where I had to sometimes verify, did I miss an episode? Cause it seems what's going on. Wait a second. No, I didn't miss an episode. We're just jumping to this next thing. It just, I, I was really surprised. I mean, for WandaVision, it, of course it was baked into, it was the fact that it's a, you know, it, it's a sort of commentary on weekly, on weekly television. This, um, it didn't really work as a TV series for me because you know, so many things that, you know, weren't built up the most, the typical momentum building you get with TV wasn't there. I mean, the penultimate episode literally, um, stops the momentum cold after, you know, um, all of these sort of big things happen with, you know, uh, Captain America murdering someone, uh, in the public square, literally. And then just to sort of suck all that momentum out for the penultimate episode that just struck me as sort of a baffling choice, which doesn't really reflect what TV does at its best now, nor did it feel particularly like a movie. So to me that I was very, I I just didn't get at all the, the, the big picture here. It felt that there were, it felt like Kevin Feige handed a, a, a stack of index cards to Malcolm Spellman with various like, okay, Zemo, Dora Milaje, you know, like all the, uh, uh, Sharon Carter and, they, it was just like, okay, play with these. And rather than having like a coherent sort of through line, like this is what this is going to be. This is our antagonist. It just felt like we kept going, getting pulled in so many directions because there were just too many pieces on the board. I mean, what really struck me when you told me about him being someone who was supposed to be rocking on Confederate, which for those who weren't following it is like a show that by and often Weiss, the guys who did Game of Thrones were proposing as their next project because, you know, these are, these are definitely people with a black grade of perspective, cough, cough, uh, saying, um, let's make a show about what if the Confederacy had won the Civil War, ignoring the fact that the Confederacy kind of won the Civil War. Um, and also just that nobody had any appetite in watching black people suffer, like, in uh like as, as in slavery in like an alternate reality show like this was just the last thing anything wanted and then you know i mean maybe malcolm spellman signed on to that show because he's like look if this complete fiasco is going to happen maybe if i work on it it won't be terrible or maybe he was like i someone who doesn't understand why that show was such a terrible idea that like the internet got it canceled um so that just to me was like whoa there but but speaking of confusion the thing that i was most confused by um, for the first several episodes was I couldn't understand, like, what the, the, what the ideology of the so-called flag smashers was supposed to be, um, and what the, what we were supposed to think about the international agency, um, that they were responding against that was like doing the resettlement work. 
And it was only after a while that I had to draw the conclusion that, oh, I don't know what their politics are because the show doesn't know what their politics are. And that was the moment where I was like, Spencer, are you watching this? Oh, God. <laughs> first, talk, and, talk, yeah. First, I know it's in the comics. Trust me, I know it's in the comics. I don't want anyone in the comments to try and bring this up as some sort of Trump. All right. I know it's in the comics, but Flag Burners was right there. How, how, how are yeah. you smashing flags? Think about it. Flag burners. I am well, not. Rigid, yeah. I know. Yeah. Again, I know it's in the comics. I don't want anyone responding. Don't at me making <laughs> that point. All right. I know it. I know. Well, it. the real flag My... smasher in the comics didn't make any sense either. Because he, uh, I was chatting with Stephen Atwell. Atwell was like, because I never read flag smasher in the comics, but you know, Stephen Atwell is like the Captain American guy. He's like, oh yes, Carl Morgenthau was the son of a wealthy Swiss banker, and he was against nations. So rather than just like being a dip going to Davos and like being corporate, he like became a supervillain. Like none of that makes any sense. That's not what rich people with power do when they object to, na to nationalities. It's, um, I mean, it, it strikes me as an excellent document of the time about how, like, I, I'm going to guess Mark Gruenwald, forgive me if I'm wrong, like thought of yeah. how to construct a left-wing villain, right? Um, so, what we... Oh, God, where to start with this? It's so awful. It's so awful. It's 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 something where, like, you, you just recognize in a certain way, like, people who just kind of aren't going to do the reading and, like, watch them construct like what they think like a uh, a left wing mass movement would kind of be for and it's just sort of airily globalist it has no material critique that i could tell um it's 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 against like the general status quo anti um for the snap um, no, nothing wrong with that, but that's, that's really, you know, a floor that's treated as a ceiling. Um, or alternatively, if it really is like some kind of like crazy, like liberal cult, I guess, um, like eerily globalist, like kind of a Benetton ad, um, hmm. then like, I wish they would have kind of made that more explicit that like we're going for a very low common denominator here i thought of like the we are the 99 percent line um yeah um I yeah sorry i was gonna say i feel like and ultimately i think what they were trying to do was that this is an international movement of people you know who had been displayed who are who had you know were, who were refugees who were going to be redisplaced and rather than like trying to solve this by building political power, like there were supposed to be some like, oh, we're going to redistribute resources, but they just completely cut all of that and made that very ambiguous. No, and they, then they had no material critique at all. The only yeah. moment, like they 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 are anti uh, the ref. I forget what the acronym is. Um, they're the anti global they repatriation yeah, commission. They're they're anti them hoarding supplies again. GRC, how could you forget GRC? G GRC, how could you forget that? It's so such a, so a memorable, G right? <laughs> and again, like what are we, as you mentioned, the flip side of that. What are we to make of this of this agency um, that's in charge of resettlement, resettling essentially the status quo ante um, for the SNAP? Right? Um, are you know? They, they they don't want to have this conversation at all. They just want to gesture at this conversation. They, they, mm -hmm. they, that, and that's going to be as good as we're supposed to get. So you get this like awful, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say awful. You get this unfortunate exercise in innuendo um, and inevitably what, you know, the viewer brings to it from their own perspective to read into the show as, as politics we're supposed to understand, but the show is unwilling or unable to articulate. And that's a really exhausting thing. Like 
there are so many there, there's there's so much to say about the times we're in right now using these specific characters and i was looking for i'll tell you this okay so this show exceeded my expectation in this respect and i could only sort of realize it once it was over and it was confirmed to me how much i i had um a poor reception to it i was convinced we were gonna get nuke in this show and mm -hmm. i'm so glad that this show in particular decided to leave that one in in the toy chest that can you imagine if if they had had if they had had nuke for for for, for this show um like oh anyway you um you mean like your character like taking uh stimulants for the purposes of having his pro-american superpowers or like to have captain america powers for the purposes of being a one-man death squad for basically being like you know someone who is going to run into the tree of life synagogue you know what i'm saying yeah ah yes um yeah no i mean like there's certainly things that could have been even more uh but what kills me is like so one, yeah, they didn't do any homework into what an actual international leftist movement would look like. Uh, they don't actually understand. And I'm say I'm not an anarchist. They don't actually understand anarchist philosophy at all and aren't interested in presenting it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was like, are they this close to doing that thing where, and, and ultimately Sam basically says in his speech at the end, like, you know, the, the flag smashers, have a good point, but they went a little too far. And I'm like, stop doing that, Marvel. Stop having mm -hmm. people who you're saying are the good guys. And their flaw is that they're going to just randomly kill people. Cause mm -hmm. like, that's like, no, that's, that's not the problem on the left, actually. Um, and like, it's, it's such a trope and, and it's slander. <laughs> it's, it's, sl it's slanderous. And, and in particular, like, I was very surprised that they went forward, um, after January 6th with a plot that involves a left-wing organization trying to violently disrupt what is billed as a legitimate democratic vote. Yeah. Right. So it wasn't the left that did that, guys. It was the right that did that. And we should say, like, at least recognize that. I thought there was still an opportunity to gesture at that um, that they passed up. Um I was convinced we weren't getting out of this show with John Walker being U.S. agent. I was convinced that we were getting him being nomad and you could do a lot more of like an Oof. Oof keeper kind of shit with that. Um, hmm. we we're basically like in his, in his now outlaw heart, he is loyal and will defend what America truly is on his vigilante term. Basically, Nomad is a settler. And like, yeah, yeah, do that with John Walker. One thing, though, about John Walker, they gave him, I forget the actor's name, Wyatt Russell, I apologize. Mm -hmm. They gave Wyatt Russell tremendously inconsistent material to work with. He did such a fucking great job. You loved hating that character. Mm -hmm. I, I thought just as an acting job, given like what this guy has to work with i i hope we actually do get this actor to be the right wing captain america that they figure they obviously want this actor and this character around i right. really hope they want us we to like get, him they want us yeah. to like him i really Which hope is so bad <laughs> yeah. so not okay <laughs> i i am so through the looking glass on this for cock to show that i found myself <laughs> Hoping on behalf of my right wing friends that they, <laughs> my right wing comics nerd friends, that they will get the conservative Captain America that they deserve because they deserve it. The I irony. don't think they deserve anything. <laughs> I think they deserve nothing. Especially not Captain is, America. The irony is this That's is the first thing. time I've ever seen Wyatt Russell clean shaven and with short hair because normally, like, he's always got a full beard and, and kind of long hair. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's, it's funny that to see him sort of take, take up the mantle. No, I, I, you know, again, that character and the failure, the thing is, I just read Spellman basically Malcolm Spellman essentially saying like, you know, kind of patting himself on the back that they, 
he feels that this show was prescient regarding um, January 6th. Which what? Uh, right? Yeah, you know, he says, "Yeah, see, you know, we were just plugged in. We were plugged into the zeitgeist, and that, of course, is the problem here. They don't see that their ideology matters a whit. They're just seeing right. extremist people who don't want to listen anymore, who don't want to be in the middle, who are taking the law into their own hands. So, even though, right, to to us, we are looking at the show in the wake of January sixth and going, yeah, this proves." What nonsense this is, right? That that you 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 punt on having a character who embodies the sort of oath keeper when he's right there. That's what he stands for, and instead you try to create this left wing, you know, boogeyman. I mean, this whole thing is just like it, it, I just kept thinking like this is Fox. This is who's the audience for this? Like Fox News watchers or or Newsmax people? Like this this crafting, just meticulously crafting this left wing sort of boogeyman out of um the flag smashers um it's just weird and 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 again this tendency that l- to to take left wing ideology and put it in the mouth of the bad guy i mean on the one hand sure that makes for com- the the idea of this making for a compelling bad guy because they actually have a sympathetic point of view or, you know, like the whole, the, the, the cliche now that we're all sick of, of the, the, the eco-terrorist, right? He just wants the planet to be green and, and healthy and w- is willing to kill as many people as, as, as necessary. Um, that's, it, it's just one more of those. And again, yeah, I think it's time we really sort of talk about like, well, what are we doing here with this? You know, when clearly that's not the world we, we're in. Clearly there are people with far right agendas who are very vocal and very, um, you know, active and very much on the move. And, you know, this show chooses to sort of ignore that and make a bad guy out of the left, which, you know, in its mind, it's trying to sort of meet, they should be sort of apolitical by doing that. But of course, that is a political choice that they're yeah. making to essentially wipe, the, uh, uh, blame the, you know, create this sort of super anti, super soldier Antifa that will, to, to that again, just, it just feels like it's tapping into all these fears of, you know, whether it's Black Lives Matter or Antifa or what have you. Um, and yeah, but I, I don't think that because the people involved in the show are not terribly politically astute, it just, you know, th- th- this doesn't, this isn't troubling at all to them, but it just, yeah, it, it, it reads very false. I mean, the whole big moment that they were so proud of with Cap sort of saying, you know, essentially, let's all meet in the middle. I mean, the, the, the events of, of, the, of January 6th kind of call that, all that into question. And again, it's just kind of remarkable how much the show, um, you know, maybe, I don't, I don't even think the uh, summer of 2020 would have, would have really um, been any, any better because, it, but at least then you didn't have this sort of insurrection happening um, with people who are very different from the, the flag smashers, whether or not Spellman and company um, sort of see that and recognize it. But yeah, it's a pretty appalling thing. I also think that this leads to a larger issue with this show, which is, you know, I think people, the whole Marvel villain thing, which was going for a long time that Marvel can't do villains. And then they had a good run of villains. It's like we, the, the Killmonger formula has kind of run, been done to death. Now I think we have ne- this show to me represents like we've taken this whole idea that everyone's got a point of view um, to the point that it just kind of, I don't know that it, I mean, look, you need a bad guy here. I mean, at some point you do need a bad guy. It's fine to do some, some films um, where you don't have a, 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 a bad guy like that, but you can't necessarily just that that's a formula that becomes just as cliche and trite as the mustache twirling, um, utterly irredeemable, you know, uh, evil guy. Um, and now it's just like, everyone has a point of view. Everyone is so sympathetic so that like, there is no the villain in this film. I mean, in the show, I mean, there's no antagonist. I mean, you could, there. it's just, it's, it bends over backwards for every character to try to justify them that to the point that like, I'm not really invested in anyone being stopped because it's like everyone is sort of almost treated equally, which I find very strange. And I don't really know how I, I, I feel like this is the point now where it's kind of reached 
the um, you know it, it's all kind of absurd at this point. But there, uh, there's no bad guy. Even John Walker gets to be part of the to the team. Gets to be a form a trio with Bucky and Sam at the end. It's like why is he here? You know, and why does he get to? And it just again because he's redeemed. Carly. She's, you know, again, the, the, the same cliche, like, yes, they've got a lot of great points. They just go too far. And yeah, it's like the, because they don't want to take a stand on anything, you know, here we go. And again, that was fine for Black Panther. That was fine for Killmonger. But I mean, I, this is, this is it now? Is this all we're doing? Is like everybody's got a, everyone's got a point of view. And so there's no bad guy and, there, and therefore there's no good guy. Well, what kills me is we actually do have a very, powerful political point made in the show that then nobody actually gives a legitimate response to, which is Isaiah Bradley. Right. When Isaiah Bradley yeah. proclaims that no black man should want to be Captain America and nobody ever successfully counters that. Like the best you get is Sam saying that he wants to try something different, like, which is completely empty. Mm-hmm. Like I, I was, I, you know, I, I want to see them debate this. Go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry. I, I was astonished to see them. I like that that the fact that they aired that Isaiah Bradley line. I was very surprised to hear in this mm-hmm. show because I was like, "Just how do you come back from that?" If the point of the mm-hmm. show is to have a black Captain America, I I don't know why they set that bomb off for themselves, having articulated no answer to it. Yeah, I I it, and like to have I I found really shocking um isaiah bradley used in the final episode to Mm -hmm. validate Mm -hmm. sam as captain america as if sam has refuted his lived experience right i i don't know what marvel is trying to say here it was i i don't know what they were trying to do with that it was and and it's so central to the show i i it's just an inexplicable choice to me um I, the one, sorry, if I can just make one quick point about this, the best I can say about where they had Sam act as Captain America in terms of giving a vision of Sam as Captain America, and it was a Sorkin speech, and I, I hated every moment <laughs> of it, mm-hmm. but it's like this idea, I think, that like Sam as Captain America is a mediator, you know, mm-hmm. someone who like will stand in between forces of an imploding America and as Captain America, get them to kind of rise above, which is to say, defer every important material and ideological question. So the point of Sam as Captain America is to not have any relevant conversation prompted by Sam being Captain America, as well as many other associated questions. And I don't know if I want to see this. <laughs> that's that's really that's really apt. I mean, the thing is, like, oh my god, we finally have a black Captain America. Like, how are we not thrilled? And what's amazing is that you know we see the bigot response, like, and how much all these right wing people who should be loving this right wing show, the fact that they can't see past the fact that there's a black Captain America, like really shows how deeply racist they are Mm -hmm. so it's been wild because like all all we all they had to do was let's show like what does it mean to be a black captain america and white people freaking out about it and like Mm -hmm. that would be an amazing show Mm -hmm. or what would it be to have isaiah bradley and and sam and just focus on that without Mm -hmm. this like we don't know what anarchists are but let's make some shit up flag smashers thing um and like the thing, the other piece that kills me is like, I really like Sam. And one of the most important things about Sam in the TV show is very parallel to one of the most important things about Sam in the comics. And that is in the comics, Sam is a social worker. And in the mm-hmm. MCU, Sam is a grief counselor. And yet we have Sam running around at a, 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 a resettlement center, essentially saying, where are my dragons? He's saying, where are my dragons? Where are my dragons? But it's, where's Donna Madani? Like of all the people in the world who would know how to talk to people to get them to talk with him, Mm -hmm. Sam would know how to do that. And you didn't even have him doing that. Now they do have him do some grief counselor work in the show. There are moments of that, but I feel like they did, they lost track of one of his defining characteristics and one of the things that makes him cool. Right. And that's what makes him a perfect 
match for Bucky. I mean, the, the ultimate sort of broke guy who's been broken by his experience in, you know, of war and violence. And yeah, it takes them until the penultimate episode to finally get to that, which is just very strange that they left that part of Sam sort of let that just go fallow for so long, left it fallow for so long when it's like, yeah, that's the whole point of Sam. That's what makes him sort of unique and, and interesting. I want to say back to the Isaiah Bradley and, 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 you know, kudos to Carl Lumley, who was fantastic. And for oh, me, yeah. yeah, I mean, no, he's, good. he's the heart of the show in many ways. And I think it was very bold to, of them to include his character. Um, and right. No, he, he makes a very damning speech. And, you know, it is interesting that they, they, they completely, again, the, this, the show just doesn't even bother to sort of bring that up. They'll feel, they feel as if the, the events of the, of the, of the final episode speak for themselves um, you know, when, you know, again, one answer for Sam to have about, well, why would you want, why would a black man want to have the shield is like, well, look at the alternative here. <laughs> the alternative is mm-hmm. a guy who smashes, uses that shield to smash people's heads in. And, you know, uh, if, 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 yes, I, I understand the ramifications of it, but, you know, better me than him. Um, and the show can't even think of that to really, to, to, to put out, to put out there. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's it's not much of um, again that at least could be the core of it, and I don't understand. I'll never understand why they did this other cliche, which is sort of the the perpetual origin story. Why this has to be a six hour origin story for Sam as Cap? Why can't we just start with the where we are in the final episode? With he's got the shield and he's got the star. He's wearing red, white, and blue, and yeah, people hate it and. But and his struggles. I mean, that is such a much more compelling show than you know. I, also, the, I don't know if it's just this Joseph Campbell thing of the heroes. The hero has to sort of reject the call. But yeah, I didn't buy for one second that Sam would give up the shield. Um, you know, I mean, because none of it makes sense. None of it that they would put the shield in the Smithsonian all just to take it out immediately and give it to um to, to um yeah to what was Walker. that like if they were going to do that they would just do that but i to, to do that to, to, to just change like that i mean uh, you know and i'm sure they're counting on people saying of course they do that man that's the man they don't want a black but come on no it, it wasn't very con- convincing and yeah I, I i just i'm stunned that this was the this is the way they wanted to go with him sort of you know uh, Again, rejecting the shield that was given was was put in his hands by Captain America. Um, yeah, the, the, I, is it that they didn't want to deal with the fact that America, a lot of racist people in America, would be upset with Sam holding the shield? Is it that was that just too much for them, and they thought, no, let's instead focus on Antifa, super Antifa, and you know how old black men are, are 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 telling young black men they can't using their own the bitterness of their own experience to keep them from doing something kind of shades of august wilson's fences right maybe that's what they were more comfortable with than showing you know hashtag not my cap as as and sort of a fox news equivalent saying that he has no business holding the shield but yeah i it, again it's either political stupidity or political cowardice i can't tell i was waiting for like the first episode for like Sam to just say like the reason why I don't want to be Captain America is because have you looked at American history? Right. And like pivot the show in that direction that they took it away from in a way that like I came across not quite understanding why in that case Sam didn't want it. And it seemed very like mechanistic hero's journey, like reluctant hero sort of thing. They decided not to, you know, use Sam's like entry point to being Captain America as an allegory for how like we owe American democracy to the African-American struggle for freedom in this country. Like that had transformative political effects for everyone's civil rights, which is to say everyone's freedom, everyone in the United States who enjoys any modicum of freedom owes it in material and direct ways to the African-American struggle for freedom throughout the history of this country. So they didn't do that either. It, 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 it <laughs> seemed like it, 
it, it just seems so much like they are determined not to have like any direct, like even having the idea of Captain America as a mediator who's going to ultimately defer these conversations in the interest of, you know, everyone's, you know, feelings and, and, and the survival for seemingly what, you know, begged question of America. But if you're even going to do that, if that's your argument for Sam Wilson, Captain America, then at least let the opposing factions actually contend, like let them actually Mm. make their arguments, which we don't get in this show. We get more and more either. I don't know. Laziness. um, Compromise in order to, um, you know, please the maximum people and, you know, not get called woke capital by Tucker Carlson. Like, I don't know, but a, a lot of this show left me with, with that kind of feeling that they're gesturing at really powerful things that it feels almost disrespectful for them to treat in this way, chiefly among them, Isaiah Bradley. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to mix things up a little bit and talk about one thing I liked. Um, <laughs> Sure. I am enjoying the uh, direction they took Sharon Carter. I, I kind of enjoy the almost meta commentary of the MCU forgot about Sharon, much like how the world forgot about Sharon. And so right. now Sharon is going to like be her own, you know, make her own way as the power broker, which by the way, I totally knew she was going to be. And mm-hmm. I think that's a cool choice. I think it's interesting. Um, I think it's a bit weird that they don't seem to be aware of Robert Moses existing, but I guess that's LA people for you. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I'm not going to say like, look, obviously, obviously, uh, I want that to be the real like purpose of yes. Sharon Carter, right? Like you wanted yes. to be like, no, be Robert Moses, like fucking gentrify Madripoor. Like that's how you yeah. exercise <laughs> like this control. Well, gentr- Madripoor is really white. So he kind of is gentrified. Yes, I guess. yes, yes. Uh, no, no but like she's imagine. going the lofts. And, <laughs> no, but like she, I'm talking like, you know, her vision is like the lofts at the princess bar. Right. <laughs> yeah. Like she, yeah. she's, she's taking over low town. Yeah. I mean, and that's something which is happening like in an actual, like interesting storyline in the Marauders comics from, you know, that Marvel is doing yes. right now. Like, wow. It's so good. Marauders is so fucking good. Um, but yeah, I, I like, I liked Sharon Carter and I thought the actress did really fun work with it. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm also, I'm sure the reason why we don't have more Asian actors in the Madripoor sequences is because then they realize that it would just be evil Asian characters because they don't have any good Asian characters. It's like, and, I, and, and who, yeah. and who are putting in this situation to die. Yeah. Exa- yes. Thank you. Um, but that's one thing I liked. Is there, is there anything you guys liked? Yes. What? I'm oh, sorry, Brandon, do you want to go first? <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I thought. And we can t- let me know when you guys want to pivot and talk about Bucky, because I want to talk about him a lot. Yes, um, sounds good. But I thought the scene with Bucky doing the therapeutic like recitation of his former magic words with Io was really moving. And Sebastian Stan acted the hell out of that. Like he tapped into something very deep and very real about not just surviving trauma, but pushing yourself past it. Um, and I loved it. I loved seeing that. I, it's a very moving scene. I don't want to say I loved seeing that, but it was tremendously well acted and uh, had a, a depth of feeling that I wish was you know, indicative of the show rather than an exception to it. Yeah, I would agree. I think that was a... Very powerful scene, um, and in general, I think all the cast. I mean, you know, I, I have friends I have who are cinephiles, and we talk about this. How often the actors are the most reliable element in in anything. You know, when the script is failing, when the direction is questionable, the actors, God bless them, they're they're delivering and they're they're you know doing the best they can uh, with what they've got. Um, yeah, for me, I think the only thing that kind of wor- that worked a bit for me was, as I said, um, the great Mr. Lumley as, as Isaiah Bradley. Um, and I, you know, I, I wish that this, that, that could have been more central to the show than it maybe was. Um, but yeah, he certainly elevated things a great deal whenever he was there. 
Um, and and it was good to see him there with a, you know his sort of long cachet and sort of in genre uh, uh, filmmaking. It's you know it, 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 that was very cool. Um, I have very mixed feelings about Sharon. I don't. I, I ultimately don't like it, although I do accept the sort of meta st- sort of statement because she's been so poorly uh, you know used and discarded here. It, it, so yeah, I, I do get that. Um, but yeah, it seems like, um, and, and I will say that the best fight scene, you know, and, and again, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, so I, that uh, fights are big. I thought the, the very best fight scene of the whole six hours was, um, Sharon at the shipyard, um, by herself taking on the goons who I, who I suppose ultimately work for her. Maybe, I don't know, but uh, yeah, that's confusing. <laughs> <laughs> But that, um, you know, Emily Van Camp, who I am told has a dance background, um, really handled that fight scene well. Um, I, I always, whenever I watch Civil War, I always wish that the fight between B- uh, Bucky when he's, you know, um, when he's under the influence and uh, Black Widow and Sharon Carter, I always wish that was a lot more epic than it was. But no, that, that was good. And it was like probably the, the, the best fight scene uh, out of all of them. Which you know is unfortunate in the show. <laughs> That's kind of the the thing is the is the is the mm. fights, and I, I, for the most part, I I wasn't ter- terribly impressed. Even bringing back um, Batroc, it just for most of them, I was a little left cold. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of talk about Sam not being a great fighter. You know that. Yes. So so that that which which is fine. I think that just means we have to sort of reimagine Captain America because he's no longer one of the great. You know the the great walking, breathing, hand to hand combatants on the planet. So you know, just so who is he now? And again, the show doesn't really have an answer for us. It seemed like they had an answer for us, and that's that. Like they are like entirely forgetting that this guy is a poor fighter with a poor record, and like even <laughs> doing Captain America Mediator. Like mostly, they have him like doing like kind of like slightly falcony shit with like rocketing himself into stuff like cannonball um so like that's kind of weird um but i guess it's it's you know they they're not willing to kind of give up on like captain america is this great like physical combatant um Mm -hmm. super weird we've seen bucky in i i forget apologies to whoever posted i'm blanking on who posted it but someone brilliantly posted like the scene in Civil War where like Bucky goes Winter Soldier and then with his metal arm throws Sam by his jaw. Like, yeah. <laughs> Jesus. Um, well, I, you know, but I will say something about Sam as a visual. Like, a black Captain America with angel wings, which is basically like the mm-hmm. new Wakandan wings. I was like, th- there's like some angel thing happening with how they're visually representing. Why the Can fuck make- is Wakanda making a Captain America suit? Like, that's weird. Well, I think they're trying <laughs> to have it be like Sam is reclaiming his right. powers as like not being sourced from American military industrial complex. They're having it right. come from his black identity. Isn't At least it more- how I read it. I don't know. But it read to me like they were mining raw materials from an African nation for the purposes of <laughs> pro- American <laughs> propaganda. Like, <laughs> I don't. I right. didn't have a different... Inter- interpretation of that it it struck me as a as a as a weird choice yeah i mean it's just like okay so wakanda when in doubt now you've always got wakanda to make you some cool shit you know if when you when you have a story and you know frankly as much as we love um seeing ao whenever possible a, a lot of it i just felt like that was just it, it felt very gimmicky and stunty and as i said to alana um, why are the Dormalaja even there? They're, they're they're supposed to be guarding the king, and this would be more appropriate for some sort of intelligence officer, uh, Wakandan spy. And of course, we know we're not going to get Nakia because you know, um, oh, th- th- that's an I Oscar know. winner we're talking about. So no, we're not going to get her for um, we're not going to get Lupita for the show. But at least you know, th- they could have been an introduction of a new Wakandan intelligence officer. But that's not what they want. They want the Dora they want um you know um Florence Kasumba because they we we know her she's the first Dora we ever saw and that and they know that's going to generate some tweets um and and a reaction I assumed assumed one of the reasons they went with with Io is because they want to mine some of um a nation under their feet from Ta-Nehisi's run uh for the next Black Panther movie like they want to remind us that she is a thing 
because like we may see her storyline more prominently in the next Black Panther movie, particularly now that there's like I think they've said they're not gonna recast Yes. Yeah, right. Like yeah, so they want to make it more about the world of Wakanda. And the ensemble. Um, right. The largely yeah. female ensemble really uh, yeah. interesting. Um it's gonna take up take it up. So yeah, um so yeah, Wakanda is always going to now be there whenever anyone needs some cool stuff to to be you know to be <laughs> to be built and made. Um, so yeah, there that that's his where his new costume and yeah, the costume's interesting. I I kind of respect that they just went full comic book, didn't try to cool it up, didn't try to they just took it right off the page and 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 gave it to him. And I'm yeah. sure there'll be modifications. But, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of, I appreciate the audacity of just sort of going, going for it and not sort of doing a toned down sort of Captain America suit for Sam. I, I, uh, I definitely want to make sure, cause I actually had literally nothing about Bucky written in my notes other than I hope people remember Becky didn't choose to do any of those horrific right, things. Right. Uh, Spencer, I understand you have, you have, you had some stuff you want to talk about, about Bucky, go for it. Yeah. So first, just getting this out of the way, like they, 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 you know, Bucky is no stranger, you know, textually and metatextually to being misused. And this was really, I found no exception. I, I didn't buy that this character would decide that it would be therapeutic for him or providing closure um, to someone else um, to go tell them that they killed a beloved, you know, relative, um, that seemed astonishingly, um, that, that was a choice I couldn't explain. Um, it seemed cruel. Um, and you know, I, I think Bucky, I really like those, um, Brubaker Epting Captain America comics where they introduced the winter soldier. Like once you can kind of get past, the you know fanboy rage of like Bucky didn't stay dead. Oh my god, this is a Simon Kirby character. You're gonna what what are you doing here? Why does he have hair like that? Um, of it all. Um I think you have like a really profound character in Bucky and an opportunity. And Alana, I know it seems like every time I go on your show, I talk about torture. Um, but you know. I think it's, it's why we love you. It's <laughs> I, I think it's important to talk about torture and its presentation when we, you know, talk about Bucky and when we talk about the name the Winter Soldier. Um so in Bucky you have this kind of avatar of, you know, never ending war. Uh he's, you know, a a a, a Greek tragic character, you know, cast to be a universal, um, not a universal, but an endless soldier, ultimately of reaction, um, acting against um, whatever will he might have, um, but nevertheless, like spending the, you know, basically like sorting out the 20th century for Hydra um, is, is what, you know, Bucky's unfortunate lot in life is. And, you know, I do a lot of journalism around torture and the experiences of survivors of torture and trying to kind of, you know, for people who write about what we call national security, but is more, you know, often, you know, less, you know, euphemistically understood as crimes of the state, um, tend to, you know, often do is, you know, not choose descriptions of how torture, operates and what its purposes are, I think, in digestible ways um, for readers. And, you know, here you get with the way they present what the Winter Soldier is, um, is basically a kind of comic booky magic um, where he gets, you know, zapped with some painful rays that seem not, you know, like anything that, you know, anyone you know could ever realistically experience and then has some magic words recited to him. And suddenly, you know, he's, he's a mind wiped person. And the way this actually happens, 
um, is through inducing um, a very disturbing psychological concept called learned helplessness. And the way you induce learned helplessness is through the constant infliction of fear at every and destabilization, violations of a body um, at every possible moment of seeming relent uh, exploitation sets in either to get something out of this person like a confession um, or ultimately to manipulate this person into doing something you want. And that becomes very rapid incentive for someone to do anything to make this agony stop. And it is, you know, by no means surprising, given how exceptionally unpleasant all of this is, that, you know, comic books and, you know, assorted literature, but really like, you know, comic book movies would shy away from this, particularly when made by the Mouse Corporation. Um, but nevertheless, shying away from it um, is a, a really unfortunate side effect of the kind of broader refusal uh, to understand what torture is and what it means for a nation to torture, what it means for a nation to justify torture, to apologize for it, um, what it means to not have imposed any consequences for it. These are the things that, like, once you've introduced the concept of the Winter Soldier, um, it's important, I think, to reckon with, because otherwise you get in the same thing, you know, you can, you know, think of characters like Wolverine Think of characters like Archangel, characters who have like a specifically physically traumatic background that renders them supposedly a different person um, uh, on the other side of it. Um, it's 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 an unfortunate trope of this kind of literature, um, but and the character deserves better, particularly given that, you know, some of the um, the recognizable symptoms and and I think the the kinds of experiences that Sebastian Stan is mining um in that scene in particular is how it means a lack of self recognition and a lack of self control and these are of course exceptionally traumatic things and the the more that Bucky is allowed to you know I I found the reason why that scene was so moving is because you got to see you know, a, a remnant, you know, something that Sebastian Stan uses to inform his performance is like, I, I forget which movie it is. I think it's in, you know, Civil War when Captain America says to him something like, you know, you weren't you. That wasn't you. And he comes back with, I still did it, though. Like, that's how he feels about it. Like, he doesn't, you know, disassociate in that moment, though they show him, you know, seemingly powerless to and the way that that actually happens um mm. is through this process that is very present you know not only you know in the post 9-11 era with the cia's torture program but throughout american history right thank it's, you it's, yeah. it's it's present in it you know from from you know chattel slavery to native genocide um the same goes with child separation there's a reason why America keeps thinking in these terms. It thinks in these terms because of muscle memory, because of interest determination. These are not accidents of American history. And it's, you know, rather frustrating. Um, and the same goes for the way that, you know, they treat, you know, John and Lamar's very fleeting reference to his, as, as John puts it, the worst day of our lives. Right. Um, you know, as 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 something that there's there's just not going to be any further discussion of explanation of Lamar makes, you know, you know, it, uh, I guess like the closest thing we're going to get to his motivation by him saying, you know, if I had only had that serum, think of how many people we could have saved that day. Um, well, you know, don't. Don't, you know, raise that and then not develop it. That's offensive. That's, you know, as they do throughout so much of this show, just gesturing at it without dealing with it is, you know, a very unfortunate stance to take, particularly when, 
this is the material you have chosen to use as touchstones for this story. It just ends up, um, you know, not adding up to saying anything that I can think of. And the stuff that I can think that it then says either, you know, by omission or perhaps accidentally, you know, I think are, you know, un, un, they're, if they're, they're just probably not for me, um, is, is, is how I would put it. I do not wish to stand in the way of uh, right wingers who love comics and who love comic book movies. You know, look, you know, uh, a movement for socialism is going to have to be a very big tent. And if, you know, the cost ultimately of uniting uh, the working class is going to be a right wing Captain America, I'm for it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, um, speaking of things that are taken in a completely completely weird political direction, I want to talk a little bit about Baron Zemo. Um, I I have never been okay with MCU not having Baron Zemo be a a, a Nazi because, like, I think it's important for Nazis to be Nazis. But Mm -hmm. um, I had literally forgotten until I was watching the series. Like, I was like, wait, what is Baron Zemo's deal in the MCU's thing again? I had to, like, literally – and I I do not have – I do not forget these things. This is not – this is not normal for me to not be able to remember this. But um, I thought the show – it's so crazy to me that everybody is like memeified Baron Zemo, who to me will just always be a Nazi. Right. Uh, but what did you guys, but aside from that, how did you guys feel about the way the uh, show handled Baron Zemo, uh, including him explaining black culture to people? That was really great when that happened. <laughs> I, I didn't get a sense that they really knew much more than like, we should have, you know, Baron Zemo return. We want to have, you know, this character stay a thing because I made a point of rewatching like the Zemo episodes for this podcast, because I came away from this thinking just like, what was he doing here? Why is he in the show? Like what, what's really the point here? And like, it doesn't make much more sense. Mm -mm. I can report back. Like it's, it's a very (laughs) flimsy it's it, it, you know, creates more problems than it solves. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's kind of nonsense, but like they like playing Dan, uh, you know, it seems like they just let, you know, Daniel Brühl um, and uh, Anthony Mackie and Sebastian Stan just sort of improv in some scenes and just like see what they would keep. Like there are lots of like kind of clumsy attempts at chemistry between actors who don't really seem to have much chemistry between each other at all. Mm-hmm. Um which at you know at the at the very least is very on brand for Captain America, um, <laughs> like it, you know it's mm. never been allowed. Like I thought you know when they have Bucky in the, you know in this in the psychologist chair, um, which I I really hated those scenes. I hated how they were directed. They were so tight. Yes, like, yes, like, yes, yes. Like yes. I like it's like after a while, I was like, look, I get it. You want it right. to be uncomfortable, but right. like, can we stop spinning the camera? Right. It's 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 too much here. Um with that scene like you just wanted like i i just blurted out like to my wife like why am i depressed like my husband left me for a fucking woman yeah <laughs> yeah and like they don't really do that they have like these weird moments like that seemed like almost like jokes that didn't land where he's like if steve was wrong about you he was wrong about me and it's like that doesn't make any sense at all right. like <laughs> No, like you, like, did you not get that? Like you were the great love of this man's life. And like, I, I'm sure you actually did. And like, you know, we're just not, you know, ever going to, going to get that. But like, that's the best they could do. And then they never deal with it again. Mm -hmm. And like, that's weird. Like, that's just, I, it was just a very strange set of choices. Zemo, you know, also it's like, okay. So again, my feeling, I just feel like they, looked at i feel like with the shows they're really leaning into okay who do we have what characters can we bring back to have some impact and with wandavision i thought it worked pretty well to have darcy show up you know and and redo her as this um as a uh scientist now and have her that that was fine and you know um and and some of the other characters that we've seen before 
have them come sort of show up. So now I, I, it seems like that's going to be a thing with the series of sort of drawing from the sort of second character, secondary characters from the films and sort of having them reappear in interesting ways with, with Zemo. I mean, for one thing, yeah, I don't, I don't really understand any of what he needed to do aside from, well, this will give us a few episodes, right? Where he's, we've got to break him out. And then we've have the intrigue of, can this guy who managed to get Iron Man and Captain America to almost kill themselves? Can we, do we think we, it's a good idea to sort of take him out and trust him and, and let him roam free? Sure. Let's see what happens. We're smart. We'll, we won't be, we won't be outwitted by him. So there's that. And it just sort of, again, keep, makes it feel like stuff's happening when there isn't. And it, and it, it all, the, so much of the show just feels like this perpetual red herring for things that aren't really developed. You know, Zemo obviously is a major villain, but I, I don't think he's ever going to be one, um, in, in the mm. MCU, he's just going to be this sort of sec- secondary figure who is involved, who is gets gets some good lines. Who you know, he's got he does have an ideology. He's the only character in this that has an ideology, which is that there shouldn't be superheroes, and that that at least I can we can hang our hats on that. And you know, when he has a chance to inject himself with the super soldier serum, he doesn't do it. He he smashes. He, he destroys yeah, it. He yeah, he destroys it. So he, he means has, he means what he says. Right. And I and that and for that, aside from Brule being a you know a, a, a fine actor and someone you enjoy seeing, that is yeah. what's going for him. I found it very strange, as I said to Alana um in our Zoom a few nights ago, I found it very strange that they basically turned him into evil Marvel Batman. Um, you know, that he's essentially, yeah, he's got a butler who, who handles some stuff yeah. for him, you know, the, 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 the <laughs> mask, which for, for, you know, nothing about it, you know, but he does put it on again, just to sort of <laughs> check that off. Oh, look, look, he's got the mask this time, you know, because since he didn't have it before and that he's lined up a little bit more superficially with the comic book character. Um, which I feel like that's becoming a thing too of sort of this part of of the MCU experiment. The kid, they, they're sort of going back on some of the things that they initially did to distance the character to sort of re make the character a little mm. more realistic. Um, now they're like, oh no no no, let's go back and like so this time we're going to actually give you the Mandarin, you know, with Shang Chi after after sort of not mm. giving you the Mandarin before, which for some people was very polarizing and with Zemo. So now yes, he's actually a Baron. It's not just Zemo. It, where he's a baron and he wears the mask and he's this and that. Um, it just seems like, again, I don't know. Uh, there's not a lot of direction and, you know, worse yet, maybe even kowtowing to um, s- sort of bending the knee to what the fans want to what's, what's, what's on Twitter. But yeah, ultimately, yeah, Zemo really doesn't add up to much. And n- none of this, you could easily cut him out of this whole thing. Um, why wasn't he on the raft in the first place? That was one of the worst prison breaks i've ever seen on anything like that it just was so dependent on so many factors just going right and the way it was told and and the fact that he wouldn't this guy who again managed to destroy the avengers just without even um with by killing a few people and setting up a few things and this guy wouldn't be on the raft in the first place that's that's ridiculous so right like the (laughs) I, i if you're gonna have like sharon carter power broker yeah like this should have been like sharon carter like hires a team of attorneys to like <laughs> file like emergency uh, injunctions, you know, for Zemo to like get him in the position of like, mm-hmm. then it's an easy break. So like, you don't even have to bother doing that. Like you would get to showcase this character's potency. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I know at I like that it. point, I think like you lose nothing by like, it was it really a reveal that Sharon was the power broker? Like, no, we, we got it right. Like, yeah. Let let her actually like flex in public, like what she's doing. Like that seems like, you know, the 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 better storytelling choice for this particular character. If the idea is like, holy shit, like while you know the world seemingly forgot about her, uh, and she's been kind of cast out on her own. Look what she's been able to do with it. So mm-hmm. I felt like that was a a kind of strange choice. Um, yeah. Can I can I also just say just take a moment to um, symbolically applaud the teams at the, uh, at the sort of uh, Netflix shows, uh, Marvel shows who, you know, at least one season, you know, with the, with the other than the shows that were abject failures, the two that were just abject failures, but I'm talking daredevil and 
you know, first season Punisher, Jessica Jones and Luke Cage. Like Luke Cage. they had sure those shows had issues. They had to deal with too many episodes. But I mean, just those shows look so good compared to, you know, and, and also working with modest budgets, working with characters who mm-hmm. are not super powered. Um, I mean, I'm, I have a new respect for what they were able to accomplish with those shows. And I think it's even more after this show sort of flailing so much and having no point of view and just sort of just throwing everything at the audience, hoping something would stick. It just, again, makes you really appreciate um, those shows. And, you know, yeah, so it, it I, and I know it must be difficult to have been involved with those shows now that they've essentially just sort of been wiped from the, you know, snapped away out of existence and, and probably yeah. will never, you know, I mean, and of course we're all waiting for the moment when, and if, uh, per, you know, one of these actors reprises their role in the, um, you know, is brought into the MCU proper, but you know, it just, again, I mean, how, how, what, what would you have, what wouldn't you have given to have D'Onofrio be the villain here? Uh, oh, in, yeah. in, in this show rather than, you know, what we got, you know, someone who is, got a presence a, a point of view and is you know legitimately fearsome uh and who would have fit in this world and i mean that's to me one of the things i'm kind of dismayed about is just you know the mcu built is built so much on realism to a degree um but it feels like they've gotten away that things have gotten so big i don't know that it feels like they don't know how to do a show like this where the characters mm. are not as powered as highly powered and in the state and and the thing that's a more earthbound well you do have a guy who flies but uh, you know relatively speaking things are earthbound it just seems like i don't know if they can do that anymore because they've just gotten so big they've also gotten away from the thing that sort of i think delivered them to the mountaintop which is always having a plan to having a genre in mind that the sh- that their movie was working off of you know that's been so yes highly effective. excellent point and lately though i don't see that lately it just seems like they're just making comic book movies and here Clearly, the, the 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 idea of them the the eighties buddy action film is really not strong enough for this for, for what this show needs to be the sort of skeleton for this show. Um, it just isn't. This is not strong enough. Paranoid seventies thriller. Yes, you got something there, but you know we've seen that before with Winter Soldier, and you know yeah, you really see. It feels like they're they're losing a little bit of the thread here, and I, I'm a little concerned about you know what the, the this phase of marvel and how much they maybe they've forgotten what they've forgotten what got the, what brought them to where they are i was dismayed when you know the credits rolled after the episode six and the show is called captain america and the winter soldier because like the whole point of the show is supposed to be that he's like he has thrown the winter soldier away the winter soldier is 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 a horror for him he doesn't want to be the Winter Soldier. He wants to never again be the Winter Soldier. And Captain America and Bucky is sitting right there. Yeah. And I, I, I like it. It gives you all of Sam's journey and none of of Bucky's. It, it, you know, functionally resets him. Are we supposed to believe that he's made his peace with being the Winter Soldier? The point of the point of it is that he is now desperate. To find any kind of peace and like the moving nature of, you know, him, you know, with Io in Wakanda is supposed to be that now Bucky has a chance at being free and he's trembling at that prospect because of how profound it is. And also trembling from the fact that, you know, he has not had that choice in his life for, you know, a superhuman, a supernaturally you know, long period of time. And there's poignancy there and there's poignancy that would be relevant to a show that's supposed to be about like tangibly discussing race. And they decide inexplicably not to mind that at all either. And, uh, it's, it's, it's disappointing. I mean, Bucky, Bucky has so much potential to be this sort of great character to be, Sort of the Wolverine figure that you know, since he's Wolverine, we 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 have no doubt he'll be with us soon enough. But he's not there yet. And yeah, it's yeah. it's amazing how little they did with him. How little, um, you know, he's just he's just a generic sidekick. And the show just didn't know how to balance 
Sam's, um, I hate to use the J word, Sam's journey with, 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 with Bucky's and, and right. Let him get, find some, some peace, forgive himself. After all, the guy didn't really have a lot of control over what he did. Um, and yeah, it just, so many of the, so many of the ways they used him were just kind of weak and, um, you know, they all deserve better than that. Brendan, what did you think about the way, uh, they handled Sam's family, um, you know, I, for one, thought the bank scene of him getting denied a bank loan was like right. probably the one good political comment made in the show. I guess that's not true. I mean, I like the Isaiah Bradley's point too, but you get the point. Yeah. I thought that was a little right. moment. What do you think about the portrayal of his family in general, of Sam's family? Um, I didn't really love it. And it's not, it's, you know, nothing again. The actors all did their job and, 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 and everything. I, you know, I understand that, you know, this is probably something to an attempt to personalize. The character Anthony Mackie is uh, from New Orleans, and you know they wanted to sort of again bring make bring in this sort of everyman quality. But I have to say, like the 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 scene in the bank was interesting, and that that I I liked it pretty well. But uh, so much of the attention on the boat and everything, I I it, I didn't love it. I didn't love it, and I I just didn't think that it really. I mean, uh, sure, we were trying to humanize Sam and it may, and the, and recognize that he has that every man sort of issue, and they're trying to sort of put plant their flag and sort of in, in that kind of realism of you know that you know the guy's got to pay his bills, and it's hard to do that when you are you know sacrificing yourself. Although again, hold on, one just one aside, what the hell happened with the Sokovia Accords? Did that just not are we just the, the, that plot point to serve its purpose? <laughs> It was, it was snapped out of existence. Right, right. I mean, if you're going to deal with that again, then then that that should be dealt with. That Sam is now essentially, um, you know, working as somewhat as a as a contractor with the state, and that allows him to do be Falcon. But of course, they don't really want to get into these things. But it's it that that plot line served its purpose. Um, so you know, as far as his family. I don't know that it really added much. I guess it was specific, and it was not sort of the, the the expected thing of having him be from Baltimore and, you know, a, a very urban thing. But, yeah, I, I was I didn't love the boat too much. Um, I actually thought the mm. training sequence in the, um, you know, it's a pretty location, but, um, you know, the, I just, again, the, the whole training sequence with him doing the flips and catching the shield, okay, I mean, it, it, I would just, again, if... If you if you start with him with a shield, we we're spared all of that. We don't have to go through the training again just to to see that. Um, but yeah, I, I and of course the, uh, one of the favorite things on Twitter was the uh, sort of lightly implied um, romance between uh, Sarah, uh, Sam's sister, and um, and and Bucky, um, which of course now is it, which is more interesting just to think about than anything we actually got in the show. Of uh, you know the the two of them have, having a a, a a relationship or or a chemistry or of any kind, but yeah, the even, white uh, wolf, yeah, exactly. Even uh, even the actress uh, Adapero Aduya, even she was sort of retweeting with laughs uh, some of the memes about uh, you know Bucky looking to the kids and thinking you know I'm going to be their dad soon, but uh, you know <laughs> it's but again for a show like this. Um, it, it it just didn't it didn't bring as much to it as I think it needed to. Well, I um I I thought like the uh, conversation that Bucky and Sam had tossing the cap shield back and forth in in New Orleans. I mean, I felt really bad for the trees, obviously, <laughs> but that was um, I liked the way that that's the scene that's the scene was put together, and they do have this sort of palpable energy between them when the show lets it, where it's sort of like. These are two people who are connected because they have the same ex and they wouldn't be right, in yeah. this level of intensity of um, being thrown together if it wasn't for this this absence of an ex that they have in common that they're not even allowed to say was their ex because of homophobia. Um, that I feel like the actors know that and act that together, which I think is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Even if Disney doesn't seem to know that. <laughs> um well, I guess Disney knows that enough to tease it, but is not going to commit to any ideals. Right. So um, where this takes us next is, I feel like, in some ways, really clear. I, you know, I, I, I don't 
I'm not someone who likes to prognosticate about the future of the MCU very much because I feel like that too often becomes either um, like a fan fiction exercise, which is like fine, but like not the point of this podcast, or it's um, corporate prognostication. But I do have a couple of things that I think are like seeds coming from the show that might be positive in the future or, or not, depending. But like, okay, very excited about the introduction of Countess Allegra de Fontaine, the uh, frequent uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and um, Starenko drawn gorgeous uh character and i love having her be julia louise drivis which is completely different than her character in the comics but like is totally fine because she's just a very generic sort of bond girl presence in the comics Mm -hmm. i love the idea of having her be funny and wry and aloof and bitter Mm -hmm. and i think she's pretty obviously setting up the thunderbolt program Mm -hmm. and i think it's pretty clear that there's going to be something happening coming out of the raft um because they just keep bringing everybody to the raft so there's some future prison break or prison fight or something of that nature in the works and uh you know the thing is like i i know now i don't know now i'm pretty sure that i think that's why they want zemo right it's what yeah they want zemo there for that and they want the the reason they and they want us to not hate um they one of the reasons they want us to not hate walkers because they want us him to be able to have another heel turn in the thunderbolts i think that's where they're pushing that to go Mm -hmm. do folks think about uh the raft about Allegra de Fontaine, the Contessa. Anything about these threads? I I love I love Julia Louis Dreyfus. So I'm I'm very happy to see both like her be this specific character, um, and also um, from what I understand, um, this was supposed to be her second appearance. This was supposed right. to be a reappearance because she's going to be in uh, the Black Widow movie. And had that been completed on schedule we would have all been excited to see countess allegra uh return um so um valentina rather what am i saying um that's right uh so that was cool um one thing that i thought um just to sort of throw out there um is that uh they obscure this a fair amount with like how they present um hydra and hydra's relationship with shield but like one of the things that like is in like we learn is is just canon um from captain america the winter soldier through the the um who's the swiss scientist whose name i'm blanking on who's the distributed intelligence you are standing against my brain that guy uh zola Uh, help me zola yes arnim zola yes is that like Hydra has been a part of shield this whole time. Like it was operation paper clipping a whole bunch of Nazis. We see that with Tommy Lee Jones in that actor uh, in the very first captain America movie. So it's not like it's not there. And so like, even though when we get to civil war in the winter soldier program and we see all of this happening in like Siberia and it's supposed to be like Hydra's, you know, elements in the KGB, Like, the truth of the matter is, is that functionally speaking, for all of this time, Bucky as the Winter Soldier has been Captain America, while Captain America has been in the ice. He has been settling the 20th century for Hydra. Hydra is inside the United States. Hydra is ensuring, you know, clearly we can see from the outcome, you know, it is Americans that populate S.H.I.E.L.D., right? Like, Americans are determining global security. Americans are... You know what? You know it's not. Ex- it's treated as if you know in Captain Marvel that like it's Nick Fury who comes up with this great innovation of like you know getting superheroes to do what the United States wants. Um, but in fact, that's from the very start in Winter Soldier, and I'm sorry, in the very start in Captain America: The First Avenger. And so the role of Captain America during a period in which America moved on uh, from the second world war that it wants to remember in such a sanitized way, the sort of shit that it does and would have its captain America do is winter soldier shit, right? Like it would have been Bucky like with, you know, brigade, you know, 2506 to try and overthrow and kill Castro, right? Like we are probably, you know, we can probably come up with, I would, you know, I would love to write if you want to, you know, actually do, you know, a right wing, you know, Captain America. 
you do it with Sebastian Stan and Bucky and like the anti-communist antics of of the Winter Soldier in the 20th century. What kind of writer's room doesn't play with that? You know, like, you know, this is the guy that killed JFK. This is the guy, you know, who, who how do you not play with this character? The fact that, right, he's in the he's been the ultimate leg breaker enforcer of the 20th century and yeah that right. what you said is far more interesting you know that he's the real captain america and that's why he can't hold a shield in public that's why when sam's having his moment he's got to be sort of in the shadows because of what he represents he's sort of the truth that's more interesting than anything that the, this six hours even came close to and that's because and yeah that's the truth and that's far that's so interesting and if you like stuff like that, please pre-order Reign of Terror yes. <laughs> uh, out from Viking yes. on August 10th. And also, uh, if you like ideas like that in a superhero universe, I am a Pulitzer Prize winning national security reporter. And right now I have no job. Mm. So if you know you want you know to commission me for such things in a superhero universe... Why don't we talk? <laughs> yes. Who could possibly turn down that pitch? Yes. Only a fool. <laughs> Only a fool. I have no pride. I have no <laughs> pride. Just none at all. You can't, you know, not, 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 not in it's, this it's, time and place. It, it's, it's gotten me this far. <laughs> right. Yes. And so, uh, Brandon, where can our listeners keep track with your work on the internet? Oh, um, so yeah, I guess the best place I'm always on Twitter whether you like it or not, uh, at Genius Bastard on Twitter. And uh, I will frequently, my feature is available. Is it the pinned tweet will take you to my second feature. Um, and I hope to be posting some uh, short films um, early, later on in this year and doing some, some writing for some places. So, but uh, Genius Bastard at, uh, at Genius Bastard on Twitter is always a good place to find me. And of surely we also follow Spencer at Attackerman on Twitter. And Spencer, do you have an, you, do you have an, a, a, a website that we would direct people to, or just to check out your Twitter account? Uh, just the Twitter account for the time being. Um, and uh, please, 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 if you've liked any aspect of this conversation from my end, um, and it's been a tremendous pleasure to have this conversation with the two of you in particular. Please pre-order my book, Reign of yes. Terror. How the 9-11 era destabilized America and produced Trump that is out August 10th from Viking. I have no choice but to, you know, plug this book shamelessly. Um, but please, I really hope you do pre-order it. Um, I hope, you know, uh, you read it um, and take something from it. But most importantly, I hope you buy it. And for the purposes and, yeah. of this conversation, I hope you pre-order it. Yes. And I was gonna say, and we have no choice but to stand. Like, there are so many times on the you. internet. Very it's real. Well, there's so many times on the internet where it's like, yeah, no, this is going to be in Spencer's book. Like all of these things that we are <laughs> reckoning with right now, all the things that make me want to scream. And like, yeah, there's a reason that you guys are the two voices who I, I booked for this episode. So thank you for joining me. As for me, I'm on Twitter a little bit too much. E-L-A-N-A -A underscore Brooklyn. That's Elon on underscore Brooklyn, where you can find me speaking at length about New York City's upcoming elections, which are very soon and in which we have ranked choice voting in which I can tell you who to vote for, for practically any race. It's amazing. Come and bother me. Um, and uh, stay tuned for future episodes of our Deep Space Nine podcast, which is Deep Space Dive. And coming up next on Graphic Policy Radio, I have an amazing episode I taped with folks, um, the creative team of a new comic called The Good Asian that is a noir 1936 crime story taking place in Chinatown. Really political, really gorgeous, really smart. Um, maybe that creative team could like do something in the MCU. Who could say? But, um, but looking forward to sharing that comic with you guys as well. So as we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games. 
you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.